studying through the book of Mark. And this week we're going to look at a lengthy passage. I'm going to read it for you. I want to read from the Phillips translation this morning. We'll read it and then have a word of prayer. I think I'm going to leave you seated. Uh, just out of deference to at least how exhausted I know some of us feel. But if you could reverently listen to the reading of God's word, and we'll follow it up with prayer. We're going to read from verses 43 through the end of the chapter in the 14th chapter of the Gospel of Mark, if you'd like to follow along. Indeed, while the words were still on his lips, Judas, one of the twelve, arrived with a mob, armed with swords and staves, sent by the chief priests and scribes and elders. The betrayer had given them a sign, and he had said, The one I kiss will be the man. Get hold on him. You can take him away without any trouble. So he walked up, straight up to Jesus, and cried, Master, Master, and kissed him affectionately. So they got a hold of him and held him. Somebody present drew his sword and struck at the high priest's servant, slashing off his ear. Then Jesus spoke to them, So you've come out with your swords and staves to capture me like a bandit, have you? Day after day I was with you in the temple teaching, and you never laid a finger on me, but the scriptures must be fulfilled. Then all the disciples deserted him and made their escape. There happened to be a young man among Jesus' followers who wore nothing but a linen shirt. They seized him, but he left the shirt in their hands and took to his heels stark naked. So they marched Jesus away to the high priest in whose presence all the chief priests and elders and scribes had assembled. Peter followed him at a safe distance right up to the high priest's courtyard. And there he sat in the firelight with the servants, keeping himself warm. Meanwhile, the chief priest and the whole council were trying to find some evidence against Jesus which would warrant the death penalty, but they failed completely. There were plenty of people ready to give false testimony against him, but their evidence was contradictory. Then some more perjurers stood up and said, We heard him say, I'll destroy this temple that was built by human hands, and in three days I'll build another made without human aid. But even so, their evidence conflicted. So the high priest himself got up and took to the center of the floor. Have you no answer to make? He asked Jesus, what about all this evidence against you? But Jesus remained silent and offered no reply. Again, the high priest asked him, are you Christ, son of the blessed one? And Jesus says, I am. Yes, you'll see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power, coming in the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his robes and cried, Why do we still need witnesses? You heard the blasphemy. What's your opinion now? And their verdict was that he deserved to die. Then some of them began to spit at him. They blindfolded him, slapped him, saying, Now prophesy, who hit you? Even the servants who took him away slapped his face. In the meantime, while Peter was in the courtyard below, one of the high priest's maids came and saw him warming himself. She looked closely at him and said, You were with the Nazarene too, with Jesus. But he denied it, saying, I don't understand. I don't know what you're talking about. And he walked out into the gateway and a cock crew. Again the maid who had noticed him began to say to the men standing there, This man is one of them. But he denied it again. A few minutes later, the bystanders themselves said to Peter, You certainly are one of them, for you're a Galilean. But he started to curse and swear. I tell you, I don't know the man you're talking about, he said. Immediately, the cock crew for the second time. And back into Peter's mind came the words of Jesus, Before the cock crows twice, you'll disown me three times. And he broke down and wept. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word and this story of what Jesus went through for each of us. We ask that as we discuss it today, that he draw near to us through his Holy Spirit, that our hearts be touched, that we learn from what he went through, 
Uh, we thank you so much for the sacrifice he made for us. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> I've got myself kind of an old heart, I think, but I'm still, I have a hard time reading these passages that relate to the end of our Savior's life. I know it's a, in some ways, it's the most beautiful story ever written because of the love of God that's shown to you and I, but it's difficult, isn't it, to think of what Jesus experienced for us. You know, the punishment that we deserved was laid on him. When you read those stories, I hope you're, mind takes you there and that you're picturing what Christ went through for you, <laughs> what he went through for me. Uh, things mean a lot, those stories. I missed a couple things in last week's presentation that uh, got pointed out to me this week, one of them at Bible study time on Wednesday. I wanted to share them just briefly with you in talking about this chapter today. Last week, we looked at the, the way Jesus addressed Peter and the intimacy that was in those, those words, the relationship that Jesus had with Peter. Uh, found that, that the address Jesus used for Peter, where he spoke to him as Peter, Peter, you know, would you really die for me before the cock crows twice? You're going to deny me three times. Uh, denoted an intimacy. It showed that the Lord Jesus knew Peter better than Peter knew himself. We looked at some other passages in Scripture where God used the same form of address in dealing with his people. I think we went back initially to the story of Abraham and his call. You know, Abraham, Abraham. Uh, he did the same thing with Jacob in assuring him about going back to Canaan. He used the same form of address at the burning bush and talking with Moses. Then this week, in our Bible study time on Wednesday, we we're looking through the book of 1 Samuel. We notice that he is the same form of address in calling Samuel to the prophetic ministry. Samuel, Samuel. Uh, here I am, Lord, speak. I think Samuel forgot to acknowledge his lordship there. He was just a child, but, you know, I'm here, speak. I, I hear what you have to say. Uh, and then this week, in studying this passage, I notice a negative example of this form of address. Reminiscent, in some ways, of what Jesus told us in the Sermon on the Mount. It's in uh, Matthew chapter 7, toward the end of the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus says that in the end, there's going to be those that come to him and say, Lord, Lord. Yeah, we ought to look at that. It's Matthew 7. Let's read it. And, Always does us good to get God's word right from the source. Matthew 7. Uh, oh, what are the verses here? 21 and 22. Thank you. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? In thy name cast out devils, in thy name done many wonderful works. Then I'll profess unto them, I never knew you, depart from me, ye that work iniquity. This form of address can be used by people deceitfully in claiming a relationship with Jesus that doesn't exist. And Christ knew it would be that way. Interestingly, Jesus didn't have to wait until the end of our age to see this come, come true. Judas comes to betray his master. Did you notice his salutation? Master, master. And betrays him with a kiss. I looked that word up too. Uh, the Phillips translation did a good job with that. It was an intimate kiss. I mean, it's not just a peck on the cheek. Judas was claiming to have a relationship with Jesus in that form of address and in that kiss. And yet he was as far from knowing Christ and as far from knowing his own heart as anybody could get. Within a few hours, he'd die a lost man in this situation. But I thought that was worth pointing out, uh, stuff I should have noticed last week and didn't. 
But there's something in this passage that jumped out at me this week, and I wanted to talk about it. It's what ties in with your story, Kirk, about how words can be used for good or evil. And that's the silence of Jesus in defending himself. There's a principle in this that I think we need to, to pick apart for our own good to help us in our own Christian walk. That silence of Jesus raised some questions in my mind. Christ was, dare we say, he was adept at, at debate in a way. I mean, Jesus had an intellect that inspired the greats of our world and still does. Uh, challenges him. He was able to see what was in a man's heart. And he could have met any accusation against him in that high priest court. Jesus was not without defense. And yet he chooses to say absolutely nothing in his own defense. And I think that's what faith does for a person. A reliance on God does that. And Jesus is giving us his response, or lack of it, as an example. If you need defended, God will do it. And Jesus is illustrating that. You know, and really, God did it when you read this story. Did you notice that the witnesses, the best the high priest could muster, they're all false witnesses against Jesus. They're all people that want to see him dead, but they can't even get their stories together. God confuses their stories. He, he brings it out that this is nothing but a sham trial. This is a mockery of justice. He shows it for what it is. The, the witnesses can't agree with themselves. Finally, the high priest takes the floor, realizing that his witnesses will get him nowhere, and addresses Jesus in a way that does elicit an answer. We're going to look at that toward the end of our sermon. When is the time that a Christian must speak up? When did Jesus speak up? But a Christian, a believer in the Lord God, doesn't need to speak up in his own defense. God will take care of that for you. And Jesus illustrates that for us. I thought of some other biblical examples of that. Uh, because we've been studying through what we're trying to study in our midweek service is the lives of the kings of Judah and Israel. We started in Samuel because Samuel is the prophet that anoints Saul. So I've been studying through Samuel, preparation for those meetings. Twice in 1 Samuel, you have David's experience in refusing to defend himself. When it actually seems, when David's companions, those that are with him, think, David, God has delivered Saul right into your hands. David's hiding in a cave. Saul needs a place to pee and steps away from the crowd into the cave. David's right there in the shadows. I mean, he's so close that in the biblical account, I think it's 1 Samuel 24, he slices off a little piece of David's robe. But he won't raise his hand against the Lord's anointed to advance his own cause. And David tells his men, he, and tells Saul, says, I'm not going to do that. He tells his men later on in the second opportunity where he's right down in the camp and I think it's Joab tells him, just give me one thrust. I'll pin this guy to the ground and he won't even whimper. He'll be dead before he knew what struck him. David says, you know, I'm not going to do that. I won't raise my hand to, to force God's hand. Not, nothing in his own defense. He says, perchance Saul will die in war or he'll die like all men do, maybe of old age but I'm not going to advance my cause outside of God's will. David makes that kind of a stand. There's another super famous story the kids in here could probably tell me. The Bible records it in Daniel chapter 3, and it's the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. That one's worth looking up and reading because of their testimony. We want to read that one together. I think it's in Daniel chapter 3. And I'm a little incensed that we have to call them Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego because I think in this instance they show conclusively that they're actually Hananiah, Azariah, and Mishael. Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah to get them in the same order as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These guys identify with 
Lord God Jehovah. They're not going to worship anything else, no matter what the king says. I want you to see their words in chapter 3 of Daniel, verses 16, 17, and 18. Uh, particularly, verse 16 shows us the same thing that Jesus is exemplifying in his trial. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, I've noticed in my study of this particular passage that in this instance, they don't give the usual salutation to the king. They don't say, O king, live forever. I don't know if that was a little jab. Uh, or if just the, the intensity of what was going on there, they didn't think the king was going to allow him very long to speak. But, O king Nebuchadnezzar, we're not careful to answer thee in this matter. That doesn't mean, O king, we're going to be a couple, two or three sassy young men and, you know, flaunt your authority. But what they're saying is, O king, we don't see any, there's no need for us to defend ourselves. We're silent in this matter as far as defending ourselves. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from this burning, burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of thy hand, O king. If not now, in the light of eternity, you know, we'll be raised to see his face. We're his people and we know it. Be it known unto thee, O king, we'll not serve thy gods. No way, no how, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. The same thing could apply for Jesus, except for Jesus himself was God. He didn't have to go through what he did for us, but he refused to deliver himself from that situation because he deferred his choices, his desires to God's will. For you and I, Jesus did that. There's some other Bible texts you could look at. This one I thought, I actually kind of was worried, Kirk, you might touch on this one in your children's story. You went to James, which was I didn't have on my list. But Proverbs chapter 10, verse 19, you know, the wise man lays it out for us like this. Said, in the multitude of words, there wanteth not sin, says but he that restraineth his lips is wise. You know, sometimes even for you and I, just as emissaries, as representatives of the Lord Jesus, the best thing we can do is not speak, is to hold our peace. Because in the multitude of words, particularly in words that defend self, there's sin. My wife used to have a quotation she'd strut out when I was trying to excuse myself for something. She'd tell me that, uh, you know, self-justification exemplifies the spirit of the evil one. And it really does. But you know, so does self-defense a lot of times. Does God bring you into a circumstance he didn't foresee? God can take care of you in the circumstances of life. Friends, you don't need to defend yourself against accusation, against other things that we'll discuss later. God's still in control. The multitude of words, you might just trip up and make things worse for his cause. There's sin in the multitude of words. Sometimes silence is the best policy. He that refraineth his lips is wise. Jesus also illustrates that there are times that you have to speak up and you have to do it decisively. Okay? That's in this story. Back to, back to Mark. And actually, we could have read on into chapter 15 of Mark. You can read the same in the other gospel accounts. The silence of Jesus is marked. But even when he comes before Pilate, there does come a time where he's addressed with questions he has to answer. And it's the same here in front of the chief priest. When the relationship with God is called into question, you have to answer. And you do it decisively. No hesitation. Uh, just lay it out for what it's worth. And for you and I, it's the same. When God's honor is involved, you have to respond. 
you get questions like, are you a Christian? You know, come out strong on it. Francine and I were watching a philosopher on YouTube this week. I really enjoy it. Jordan Peterson is a, a sharp man. I enjoy watching him. But the interviewer asked him if he's a Christian, and he would not come out and plainly say, you know, I am. He's talking about how he sees the Christian worldview as being just a, you know, one of the greatest pursuits in history and that it's an aim at the ideal and that it's something that he can tag along with and that he considers himself part of, but didn't come right out and say, I stand with the Lord Jesus Christ. You and I are not going to meet the same kind of questions Jesus did. We're like, are you the Christ, the son of the blessed one? But you are going to have occasions where people ask you, are you a Christian? You come out decisively in instances like that. Yes, I am. Exclamation point. Yes, certainly, unapologetically, yes. I stand on the side of the Lord Jesus Christ. Probably more often you'll have people attack certain beliefs Christians have, particularly in, in our day and age, the belief about creation. You know, you have people ask you, do you believe that nonsense? Get right back. Adam on that. Don't try to defend. Don't try to build up the case particularly. I think that would be casting your pearls before swine, basically. But yes, absolutely I do. I believe it. God said it. Yes, I believe it. There's times where you you must answer when God's honor is at stake when somebody questions your relationship with the Lord Jesus. You answer. Yes, yes, yes. If there's more that needs to be said, there's a passage we just studied a little while ago in Mark chapter 13, verse 11, that gives us a clue about how the Christian responds if there's more that needs to be said. When you're called before rulers, when you're called before those and asked to give your testimony, don't go thinking beforehand. It's Mark chapter 13, verse 11. Don't be stewing on it before the time comes up because God will give you in that instance what you need to say. Trust his spirit to lead you in those times where you know you must speak up for the Lord Jesus Christ. Where to be silent would be a denial of Jesus. More ways to deny Jesus than Peter did in what we read this week. Sometimes your silence can be doing the same thing Peter's cursing and swearing did. You know, just pick the times. When God's honor is on the line, when your relationship with him is questioned, don't be apologetic about it at all. Be bold about your belief in the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus says that's rather important to him. I want you to look at a rather stern warning, Matthew chapter 10. It's verse 32. It's a warning. It's also a promise. It's one that, you know, if you're living your life for Jesus, you can claim this as a promise. Matthew 10, verse 32. Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess, confess also before my Father, which is in heaven. Whosoever shall deny me before men, him will I also deny before my Father, which is in heaven. Pretty stern warning in a way, if you're denying Jesus, but what a, what a precious promise if you don't. If you stand on his side and make your confession. I want to make a confession for Jesus today, and I've, I've written some things down. I'm actually, I've been thinking about this for a bit, and I wanted, I've written it down so I don't miss any points. I make I'm pretty close to just reading this for you. I was thinking this week the example of faith that Jesus gave us and what, what that teaches us about what faith is. Okay? Faith doesn't question whether God is able to perform his promises. All things are possible with God, and by faith we lay hold of that power. Actually, Actually, we're laying hold of his power, aren't we? But faith is not sight. Faith is not feeling. Faith is not reality. 
Faith is the substance of things hoped for. It's the evidence of things not seen. To live in faith is to put aside feeling and selfish desires. It's to defer to God's sovereign will in our lives. Faith is believing that God is working out his plans and purposes in our lives and to trust him in doing it. For me, faith is accepting what God's blessed me with recently. Faith is accepting long COVID for me as part of my reality. You know, it it's hanging on through the black, dark days, and there are some of those. I had a day this week. This past Wednesday was the darkest day of my entire life, and I think it's part of a disease process. It was not something that... Uh, that you could wish your way out of. But it's something God saw fit to let come my way. For me, it's looking for what God can teach me in the experience. Finally, and I think most importantly, faith is a confession that Jesus is Lord of my life. And that although I can't understand what he's doing, you know, he's God after all, and none of us will be able to understand him completely. I'm going to trust him to take me wherever it is he wants me to be and where he wants me to go. I've had days where I told Francine that I think this virus is going to put me in the ground. I don't, rationally, I don't see that as God's plan. You know, I think in some ways he's shown incredibly incredible mercy to my family and that I could get as sick as I did and my dad didn't die. I mean, he lives right in the house with me. My wife barely got the sniffles out of it, you know, but it kicked me. He, he protected them. Maybe, to my way of thinking, maybe God is just trying to take an old hard-hearted Don Lee and teach him how to be compassionate with other people. I hope. I hope that's what it is. But faith is trusting God with whatever he brings our way. And what comes our way doesn't get there by accident. I mean, he orchestrates things in our life to accomplish our sanctification, to make him part of his purpose and plan, to, to prep us for what he'd have us do in life. God allows things to come our way. I hope that you stand with God in that same kind of of faith, that you're willing to take what comes your way. And I'm not, I'm not suggesting by that that you just ignore the things that God has provided that might prevent, you know, what I've gone through. Probably won't because people get sick anyway, and maybe it complicates your life. Those are your decisions to make. But let God be God in your life and trust him with it completely. Don't feel that you have to fix it yourself that a defense of self is necessary. God may choose to lay some of us to rest as part of his sovereign plan for what he wants to accomplish in this community. God may choose to heal others of us in marked ways. God, God's God. Faith is allowing him that position I don't know what, what path you're on, really. But let Jesus be Lord of your life. Don't, don't feel that you have to understand where he's taking you. Just accept that his will is what you'd want for yourself and trust him. Trust him with it. Uh, in the meantime, if you guys run across your pastor and he looks like he's just about ready to cash in his chips or just throw in the towel and quit you know don't don't give up on him it at least this past week that blackness only lasted like a day uh, the next day was a little better and the day after that was considerably better uh, if you happen to be experiencing those kind of things don't hesitate to call and you have a friend that knows what you're going through because it's been the weirdest experience of my life. 
you know, that God's put me through. But I trust him in it. I don't know what your situations are in life, but I would bet you anything that almost everybody sitting here has things that they know God has led them to in life that they, they don't really understand why even because it has done nothing but complicate life, been nothing but, maybe even nothing but hard times. I don't think God owes us an explanation of where he leads us, but I do think he's promised to give us one, just not necessarily in the here and now. Trust him until the time comes and you'll know the why. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the example our Lord Jesus set for us. We know that whatever he bore was so far above and beyond anything we can experience. It's Our lives are just uh, imminently easier, really because of what he's done for us. It gives us strength, uh, gives us his example. We don't even know what it would be like to be separated from his love and care, and we ask that we never experience that. Uh, we thank you that he went through the, the darkness he went through where he couldn't see his father's face, where he was just abandoned by his friends, where everything looked like it was against him. We thank you he went through it anyway and that he did it for us. If we get little trials that come our way, I ask that you help us to rely fully on him, to just accept them as from our Father's hand. In Jesus' name, amen.